Welcome to Sex and Happiness with Lori Handlers. Amazing sex and intimacy are just around the corner. While Lori puts the finishing touches on her new book, Sex and Happiness Over 60, please enjoy this show. It's one of her favorites from the Sex and Happiness Archives. Today I have a wonderful guest who I would say adds a lot of sex and happiness to the world. He's added sex and happiness to my life, and I'm hoping that he'll add sex and happiness to your life. So today, Charlie and I are going to be talking about somatic sexual healing and sexual embodiment. Charlie, welcome to Sex and Happiness. Thank you, Lori. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's great to have you, and it's really great to have you since I saw you recently. You were in Phoenix, and so I knew right away we had to do another show together. Yeah, thank you. That was a real treat. Let's talk first, if you would, uh, define somatic sexual healing for me, would you? When I started as a sex educator uh, over 20 years ago, I mostly focused on talk-based work. It was workshops, and it was writing, and it was more talk-oriented. And one of the things that I discovered over time is that there's a limit to how far talking can take you. Uh, in in the same way that you know I could talk with you about how to cook a delicious meal, but eventually we're going to hit a point where you have to start learning how to do it in real life. Uh, so somatic sexual healing is a lot like that. It's working with people uh, to help them discover uh, the embodied experience of stating their boundaries, asking for what they want, what does pleasure feel like, how do they know what feels good to them. Um, And these might sound like really simple questions, but I've found that a lot of my clients, uh, for example, have difficulty staying present during sex. Maybe they tune out, uh, they go so deeply into a fantasy that they're lost in the movie in their head, and so they're not really present Um, or maybe they are experiencing something that doesn't feel as good to them as it might. And rather than speaking up and telling their partner, Hey, could you do that a little differently? They just endure and hope that things will get better. And so somatic sexual, uh, healing and somatic sex education, uh, is giving people the embodied experience to help them learn how to overcome all of these challenges. Um, so it might be something as simple as, teaching somebody different ways that they can ask for what they want. Uh, Or it might be uh, guiding somebody through an erotic state uh, so that they can actually stay present and centered and grounded during it rather than uh, going into that movie in in their heads. Okay, that's great. I I like that. I mean, I like what you're saying. And first of all, I couldn't agree with you more. Talking about things is just talk. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, in high school we had an expression. You know, the UN had a had a branch of the UN called NATO, and I don't even know what NATO in the UN stood for, but we used to call NATO no action, talk only. Mm. And it's so boring because most people talk and talk and talk, and then they don't actually live and live and live. So the distinction you just made helps me feel like you're guiding people in the living of their life, in the feeling of their life, in the experience, in the body of their life, not just talking about what it would be like if. Exactly. And and it doesn't necessarily mean that people have to have full on erotic experiences with me. Um that you know, for example, one of the things that I've done with some of my clients, I was working with a male female couple, helping them find better ways to communicate around touch and boundaries. And the problem they were having, this is a very common situation, uh the woman in this particular relationship had a lot of difficulty saying when she wanted something to be different. She expected her boyfriend to just magically know through her body language that it wasn't working for her because she had never had the experience of trying out different ways of saying it. And so we actually got to practice it and he would touch her arm and she practiced saying to him a little softer, a little firmer. No, I don't like that. Try doing it this way. Uh, And that's the foundation to be able to say to a partner, oh, I really like it when you go down on me, but when you 
suck too hard on my clitoris, it's actually painful. So could you do that a little softer? That's right. a very so, good example. I mean, that's just as, that's as straight as, as example as, as yeah. you could get. And, and, and that happens a lot. That really happens a lot. Uh, it's easy to say to people, uh, you, oh, you have to talk with your partner about it. But that's like saying, oh, well, you have to go to yoga class and, and do a little stretching. Right? It works much better when you can guide somebody through the process. <laughs> That's that's excellent. So you make people be really so there is talk involved. Of course, there's talk. There's got to be communication. It's all communication. But wishful thinking that a person's going to read our body language, whether we're male or female, is not communicating because that's a totally that's that's open to interpretation on the part of the of the person who's giving. Exactly, and then and, the, and then the receiver interprets it also as oh this person really doesn't love me they're not doing what I want right because we have this myth that when we love someone they magically know what kind of sex we like that would be like saying oh well if my boyfriend if my wife really loved me they would know exactly what kind of Chinese food I want them to order right when we're getting Chinese takeout so. But there, but there is this myth. And so a lot of the somatic sex education that I do is helping people actually find those skills. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a reason why uh, when people are learning to become pilots, they get put in a flight simulator. And when people are learning how to be chefs, they take classes in a real kitchen uh, the, because we learn best when we are in a similar frame of mind as the experience that we're going to be doing. It's why when people are learning first aid skills, they don't give them 20 minutes to put on a Band-Aid and take it nice and slow and easy and think about it. You actually want the paramedic in training to be stressed out while they're learning because that's going to simulate the real life experience. It doesn't do you any good to learn how to do things when you're calm and then when you're in a real life stressful situation, all of that goes out the window. So my, my job as a somatic sex educator is to help people learn the skills uh, in a way that that simulates the real life experience as much as possible so that they can actually use those skills in real life. Well, this is great. I there's a I have this I have to a question pops in because I'm trying to picture it. And I think it also relates to sexual embodiment, which is are the people actually having sex with you present when you're teaching them also how to speak about it? Or is it a conversation? This is my mind, where my mind's going. Or is it a conversation where you meet with one partner and you say, well, what is it that your partner does or doesn't do well in sex that you were wishing he or she would do different? And then you meet with the other partner and find it out. And then you have the conversation with them. Or are you actually in there observing that the person's holding their breath and they're going, Mm-mm, you know, and they're doing, you know, how, how is it that you, that you coach that them? Yeah. So people aren't having sex while I'm guiding them through it. Uh, although there are some somatic sex educators who do that work. That's not what I'm drawn towards doing. Okay. Um, you know, there's exercises and practices that we can do that are fully clothed. Like I mentioned the touching on the arm. Um, but I'm also, a trained sexological body worker. Um, sexological body work is a training that was developed by Joseph Kramer a while back in San Francisco. And in sexological body work, we do hands on uh, erotic work. There is genital touch depending on what the client needs. Um, and there's different ways that we can do that. For example, there's a there's a modality that we sometimes do called pleasure mapping, which is a uh, erotic massage. It's all hands. I stay fully clothed and all touch is one way and I'm wearing gloves. So there's a very clear boundary and container for this work. Um, but with pleasure mapping, it's amazing how many people don't know how to describe what kinds of sexual stimulation feel good to them. So what? Do you, so you're wearing gloves, you have a boundary and you're mapping with people on what it is they're considering possibly for the first time 
knowing what gives them pleasure. That's my picture. Well, the the thing that often happens for people is uh, they know when something feels good, but they don't know what their partner is doing. And so what I mean by that is there's a really big difference between saying to a partner, you know, do that thing you did that time. You remember we went to that romantic bed and breakfast, right? And, and saying to them, I like it when you do little circles on my clitoris with your fingertip, or I really like it when you do a twisting motion on the head of my cock with your hand. Um, and so in pleasure mapping, the goal is not to have an orgasm. If orgasm happens, that's totally fine. But the goal is to actually learn what feels good and what doesn't for this particular person because we're all different. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm able to put into words what someone likes so that then they can turn around and tell a partner. Uh, and so some of the things you know, somebody might discover or we might discover in this work – oh, I really like firm circles on my G-spot, or I really like having my labia massaged. Um, I really like light touch on, my, on the head of my penis, but I like really firm squeeze on the testicles. Uh, so and, you really put the language, you really, and, but when, when I, so I get that part, that's the person who's receiving, mm -hmm. actually having a conversation about, I like this, I like this, but, they might not know what the person is doing. This requires a conversation when the person's doing the thing that says, wait, stop, what are you doing now? Exactly. Exactly. Right. And the, the value in pleasure mapping is that it, it's, there's two pieces. One is that, okay, now this person has learned what works for them today but our sexuality is always changing. There are things that you'll like when you're 50 that you didn't like when you were 15. Um, that's just how bodies work. That's so correct. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the, the challenge then is actually learning the skills to be able to say, okay, well, that thing that used to be my favorite doesn't really work anymore. So let's play around and experiment and find something new. So this is the alternative to saying, honey, you don't turn me on anymore. I want a divorce. Right. <laughs> right. That, that's a whole separate thing. <laughs> yeah, not, not getting the sex that feels good to your body is not inherently a sign that the relationship is bad. It just means that something isn't working sexually. If you can talk about it and you can find something that works better, then that's a completely different situation. So what I love about this conversation is that it brings hope to people who feel hopeless because people have been so suppressed in their sexual expression altogether. And then in the talking about sexual expression, it's like a twofold thing here. And then it's a threefold thing because it actually involves touch then saying, okay, this is good. This works. No, that's not so good. That doesn't work. This is, you know, it's opening up an arena, which we, you'd think, you know, human beings have been on the planet for thousands of years and you'd think that they'd be able to talk about this and actually have the communications and then, you know, go to work on it. And so many people are so shy and suppressed and have been taught to not talk about it. Oh, it's hard. It's really hard. And there's shame and there's triggers and there's trauma and assault and there's people taking it personally. Um, you know, this is one of those things, uh, you know, people used to joke back before everybody had GPS in their phones. You know, we used to joke about how many guys would rather be lost than stop and ask for directions. Because, Correct. Right. But, but the same thing happens in bed. A lot of people, but particularly men, take it really personally if a partner says, oh, I need you to do something different. Because, you know, a lot of guys get very ego driven around this idea that, oh, I know what I'm doing. I know I'm a good lover. And so having somebody tell them, hey, could you do this a little differently can actually be quite challenging. So it's not just teaching people how to give that feedback. It's also teaching people how to receive that feedback. Yes. And I can see that this is such an important skill. I can feel the line of demarcation in my body and, and I can also know about it. Until I started to take Tantra, 
and study it, which started a little over 20 years ago. Like I wasn't, I loved 